Welcome. Today we look at how COVID-19 affected the access to maternal health information in rural and urban communities in Ghana. With the help of our two guests, Sahar Kamis and Delay Tagboada, both from the University of Maryland, we will be talking about the role of technology in determining the quality and quantity of information that expectant mothers had access to during the pandemic. We also dive into the motivations and challenges of maternal health information access during this time. I'm Rodrigo Silva. Let's talk about media and communication. This podcast is powered by Cogitatio Press. You can listen to this episode on the Let's Talk About Media and Communication website, on Cogitatio Press YouTube channel, and whatever you get your podcast. Sahar and Delight, thank you so much for joining the conversation. Thank you thank so you much for having us. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Of course. Uh, I would start perhaps, Sahar, with you by asking you, because your article focuses on access to maternal health information in Ghana. So why did you find this topic worthy of conducting research on? And why Ghana? Well, thanks so much again for having us on this podcast. It's a pleasure to talk about our uh, co-authored article. Uh, I'm an Associate Professor of Communication at University of Maryland. Delight is my brilliant and excellent PhD advisee. And she is actually from Ghana. So the selection of the topic was based on her own country of origin. The interest in the topic, however, is mutual between both of us, since I'm also a scholar of media and also gender and women's studies with a special focus on women's issues in the global south. And we feel this is a very important blind spot in the, in the body of literature that deals with health in general. There is a little uh, literature that deals with maternal health, and especially when it comes to maternal health among women from the global south. Therefore, we really felt it's very important to fill this very important gap in the existing body of literature in health communication, in gender studies and women's studies by focusing on both an understudied topic, which is basically maternal health communication, and an understudied population, in this case, uh, women in the global south, specifically in Ghana, which is the country of origin of my co-author, as I previously mentioned. We felt this is very important also to pay attention to a topic that has been neglected even in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and in the midst of research and scholarship that tackled the COVID-19 pandemic, because a lot of these studies talked about things like, you know, vaccination and resistance to vaccines or social distancing and masking. But we did not really see a lot of attention paid to the idea of how women are being impacted in terms of their own motherhood, their own maternal health, maternal health communication, maternal health experiences. This has been also a blind spot and an understudied topic in the body of literature also that dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic. So for all of these reasons, we felt it's very important to pay attention to this understudied topic and to also give voice to the voiceless. Both of us are feminist scholars. Both of us have an interest in gender and women's issues. And it's very important using qualitative methodology in this particular research to give voice to the voiceless. In other words, to listen to the voices and the experiences and perspectives of these women in their own words, and that's another value of this important study. Absolutely. Delight, let's follow up on uh, this giving voice to the voiceless and jump into the main findings of your article. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, Rodrigo. So one of the things that we set out to study, as Dr. Kamis mentioned, is the information sources that these women had during COVID. And we found out that when they are reliance on their maternal health experts, their midwives, the healthcare providers was threatened by COVID-19 restrictions. They were able to use other sources to fill in the gap in their knowledge. So we found that they relied mostly on sources like their friends, their family members who have had the experience of pregnancy and childbirth and also used other sources such as the internet. So the internet's use was heavy, particularly among the urban mothers who already had access to the resources to access, access the internet. So we also found that although their relationship or their access to their providers was threatened, they still had the opportunity to speak to their providers when they wanted. So some of the women were given personal phone numbers of their midwives that they could call at any time to have 
a conversation with them in relation to what they were experiencing during pregnancy. And this was highly pronounced for women who lived in rural areas. So they kind of had this relationship with their healthcare providers that they were able to have access. And this was enabled by the mobile devices that they had and they could connect with, with their healthcare providers. So some of the other sources that they relied on were books and mainstream media. And although some of these women did not find much information in mainstream media, there were snippets of maternal health information here and there, but it wasn't enough. So all in all, the sources that they used were the healthcare providers, the internet, interpersonal networks, and the media. Uh, very, very interesting. You've been, there's been a focus here on the conversation. Sahad, I would like to follow up on this to look at the impact of the research in real case scenarios, because it seems that it points out the importance, and the light has said that uh, as well, the importance of access to technology and investing in health literacy to expectant mothers. Can you elaborate on this, Sahar, how, on the impact on social policies? Yeah, that's a very important point because as a scholar also of health communication, I paid special attention to this particular aspect of public awareness campaigns and public health in general. And as Delight mentioned, we, one of our main findings was women needed more information through different channels, one of which was, quote unquote, mainstream media. However, there was a shortage in terms of supplying this kind of information through, for example, community radio or local television. So that's a very important thing to be paid attention to in future research and other scholars who want to also study this topic, as well as government actually designing the kind of public awareness campaigns and public health literacy campaigns that these women need the most and providing this kind of important and valuable information through mainstream media such as community radio and television and also designing it in a way that's most relevant and applicable and meaningful to this particular segment of the population. Because my previous research, for example, in rural Egypt showed that some of these governmental public awareness campaigns are completely out of touch with the targeted audience or targeted population. They do not really address women's needs or their own wants and demands, and therefore they don't really resonate with this particular segment of the population and are not effective. So also doing audience research and making sure to tailor these messages and these public awareness campaigns to women using a mainstream media is very important, in addition to the importance also of positive peer group pressure. In our study, we also noticed the importance of interpersonal communication. That's a very important area as well that seems to be a blind spot sometimes in this type of research, women sometimes rely on other women and on their own interpersonal networks to get information about maternal health. So this importance of interpersonal communication and face-to-face -face interaction also needs to be paid attention to. And finally, the light mentioned mobile devices. That's also very important. Infrastructure and making sure women have access to these types of mobile devices is also very important because some of them relied on these devices to get access to the internet and to be able to do, for example, a Google search of the most important maternal health information. Perfect. We have touched upon the so what of your research, very well explored. Let's look uh, ahead now. Let's look at the future. Starting, I would like to listen to both of you, uh, starting with the light. So for the researchers and planners that are listening to us, what should they focus next? So tell us more about what happens from now on. Thank you, Rodrigo. So we have conducted the initial research into understanding the information access to mothers in um, rural and urban areas in Ghana. Moving forward, we, we're thinking that researchers should begin looking at how the information that these mothers assess from the various sources that we have found in our study impacts their behavior. So when it comes to their maternal behavior, how does the information that they get influences how they relate or how they take care of themselves during pregnancy, how they take care of their, their child and how they interact with the healthcare systems during pregnancy. And also we are thinking that researchers should also focus on the credibility of, of information that these mothers have access to on the internet. So one of the main findings of our study is that women who use multiple sources of information for their um, during their pregnancy are able 
or are better positioned to understand their bodies, their pregnancies, and are very, very up to date when it comes to their healthcare with the healthcare system. And then so we are thinking that researchers should move forward to understand the credibility of information that these women have access to, particularly on the internet, because there's a pool of information, tons of information on the internet, and a quick Google search can bring you millions of information, millions of data. So you are, we are thinking that researchers should start focusing on how the information that the women are retrieving are authentic, are credible, and are not harming the women who are accessing this information because we we want these women to have optimal pregnancy experiences other than negative effects out of this information that they access, access from the various sources. Of course. Sahar, let's follow up on this. I would also like to listen to you on this. Let us know a little bit more about the research limitations, because I think it's important to touch upon this as well. Yeah, before talking about the limitations, let me follow up on something very important that Delight was talking about, which is basically the credibility of the information. Now we are living in an age where we have, unfortunately, sometimes an overflow of misinformation and disinformation. So I think future research also needs to look at this very important point. How can we verify the authenticity and the accuracy of this type of information. It's actually accurate, factual. It's not made up. It's not, you know, this information and misinformation. I believe that's a very important thing for researchers to look at and explore uh, moving forward. In terms of the limitations of our study, of course, it's a qualitative research study. So we had a small research sample, like most qualitative research, and that means we have limitations in terms of representativeness and generalizability. We cannot claim that this study is representative or generalizable So all urban and rural women in Ghana, let alone in Africa or in the global south more broadly. So I think that we need more studies and more research, like I said at the beginning, to fill this important gap in the existing body of literature, maybe explore this very important topic in different contexts, in different settings, in different countries, especially with paying attention to women in the global south, because they are the understudied minority in this particular type of research. We should give attention to this particular marginalized community maybe use also a mixed methods approach, which complements or supplements both quantitative and qualitative research methodologies in order to give a more holistic and more comprehensive overview of this very important and timely topic by trying to give, for example, some kind of overview using some kind of quantitative survey and at the same time augmented and complemented using, for example, focus group discussions and in-depth interviews using a qualitative research methodology. In our study, we used in-depth interviews, we can also use focus group discussions as one way to explore this particular topic in other research uh, moving forward. And I want to add one last limitation, which is basically that uh, some time has really, uh, you know, has lapsed between the time these women experienced their own pregnancy during the pandemic and the time we actually asked them to recall these particular experiences. So that meant that some of them maybe had a difficult time recalling or remembering all the small Uh, you know, nitty gritty, minute details of their own pregnancy and their own maternal experience, that is another limitation in the study. So maybe in the future, I don't want to say, God forbid, another pandemic, but whenever there is a health crisis, it's best to actually do the study during the crisis itself as it's actually unfolding at the moment, rather than later in order to avoid the problem of the women's ability or the participants' ability to recall or to remember the accuracy and the details of the information. Absolutely. The highlights for future research focused on, as you said, so perhaps different methods, the timings of research, which you just mentioned, and of course, credibility of information, which is what touches upon several other areas. So some highlights for future research. Delight, if our listeners wish to further explore this topic, what materials would you would recommend they consult? Right. So we've put together some resources that participate of listeners could have access to. And we did this specifically for people living in Ghana because this is specifically tailored to the cultural, the social cultural environment that they're in. They are pool of resources when it comes to maternal health. You can get some coming from the West and all that. But we decided to look for the ones that are within the community that participants or listeners might have interest in. So we First, there's this app called the Talkative App, the Talkative Mom app. And it's the first 
parenting app by a Ghanaian woman and she's had her experiences and everything. Everything is built around Ghanaian women. And also we have Dromo Baby, which is a, a Facebook page and a YouTube page that mothers share their experiences. We are hopeful that when women listen to this, they are able to glean from the experiences of other women as well in terms of pregnancy and childbirth. And we also have Ask the Gynecologist. This is a, a Facebook page that I, I believe the, the administrators are Nigerians, but this is huge. It has over a million participants in the group and they also share pregnancy and childbirth information. And we believe that this the sources are very credible as these administrators and managers of the pages have had fast experiences when it comes to mothering, parenting, pregnancy, and all that, yes. And also, we have also put together some academic resources for our listeners. If you want to read more on this topic, there are some scholarly articles that we have put together and I cannot mention all of them, but these would be in the link that will be attached. Precisely. To follow up on what Delight has just provided us, if you are watching us on the Let's Talk About Media and Communication website, the recommended materials will be a little bit below from the, the page, so you can uh, have access to all these resources that both Sahar and Delight have provided you. Sahar, let's close this episode with a punchline. If you could shorten this conversation we just had, in a couple of sentences, what would it be? I would say the divide is real, and I want to talk about three different divides here. The first divide is the divide between the global north and the global south. That is a very real uh, and very much impactful uh, divide that we have to be aware of when we talk about issues like health communication and maternal health communication. The second divide is the digital divide. As much as we would like to hail the role of the internet and digital communication and digital media and say, yes, it's awesome that we have the internet. We have to remember that not every part of the world has 24-7 internet access, a high-speed internet on a 24-7 basis. Not every person on this planet also has digital literacy skills. So we have to also remember the impact of the digital divide. And the third divide is the gender digital divide, that all of these issues are multiplied many times over when it comes to women, because a lot of women, unfortunately, are deprived from access to sources of information, including maternal health information, because they don't have access to high-speed internet and or digital literacy skills. So I want our listeners and viewers to remember the impact of these three very important divides and to also bear in mind that the COVID-19 pandemic had an amplifying and escalating impact when it came to all of these divides, increasing these gaps and increasing these divides even more. Amazing episode. Sahar, delights. It was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. This podcast is powered by Cogitatio Press. You can listen to this episode on the Let's Talk About Media and Communication website, on Cogitatio Press YouTube channel, and whatever gets your podcast. <laughs>